Welcome to Worship with Trinity United Methodist Church. You are invited to light a candle in your home to honor the presence of the Holy Spirit with us today. This morning as we continue our journey through the book of Acts, our Bible story will be told by the Long and Sherniak families. You persecuted Jesus. Stone him, stone him. Lord, receive my spirit. Do not hold this against them. Praise the Lord. Where are they? Damascus. Who are you, Lord? It is I, Jesus, who you persecute. I'm an angel of the Lord, and I need you to visit this man, Saul. He has been a horrible person, has he not? This is true, but God has a plan for him. Very well. When you live for God, you never know what will happen. So we're back with the Jewish community in Jerusalem, 
And as you remember, the Holy Spirit has prompted them to a new way of being where they're kind of all equals around the table. They share everything and no one is in need. Well, that's all well and good for a little bit, but then there were some problems because it came to the attention of the disciples that uh, some of the Jews were being sort of neglected in the distribution of food. And there was actually a bit of a difference between these Jews who were around the table and the Jews who were not around the table, who were being neglected. The problem was that these Jews are um, Hebrews and these Jews are from the diaspora and so they are Greek speaking. So you might call this a kind of discrimination. Uh, you might just call it neglect. But the disciples realize that this is a problem and they don't have time to deal with it. So they say, okay, appoint for yourselves some men who will take care to distribute the food evenly and equally. And so they lay their hands on seven men who help to bring everybody to the table so that now we have Hellenistic Jews who are Greek speaking and Hebrew Jews speaking Jews and everyone all equally sharing in the resources of the community. So one of these men that is chosen is Stephen. The disciples lay hands on Stephen. There's the Holy Spirit. He is filled with the Holy Spirit. And he's really kind of a remarkable figure. And uh, he's going to be doing many signs and wonders. And he is going to create some uproar with the religious elites. So remember these folks, um, the council, the Sanhedrin, some of the scribes and Pharisees, but also some of the ordinary people are gonna get involved. They are just not pleased about Stephen, the signs and the wonders that he is performing, and it uh, alarms them. Now, if that's ringing a bell, it's because the story of Stephen is actually very similar to the story of Jesus. This Jew who was claiming to stand in the tradition of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and yet doing signs and wonders that really caused a lot of um, problems for the religious elites. When Stephen is brought before the Sanhedrin, and the chief priest, they essentially ask him, who are you? Are you with us or are you against us? Are you one of us or are you an enemy? And that question, who are you? Are you for us or against us? These are not a series of questions that join people together. And we know that the whole of the book of Acts is about God's desire to join people together. The, uh, San Stephen, when he goes before this council and is asked these questions, he responds by telling them the story of the history of Israel and making it tell us the story of Jesus, bringing it to its logical conclusion in Jesus Christ. And as he talks, they gaze attentively at his face as if he were an angel. Dr. Willie Jennings asks, what does the angel's face look like? We don't know, but could it be that the particular characteristics of his face are not at play here, but rather its orientation? Stephen looks as though he is now inside a new reality of heaven and earth one that can only be imagined as being of angelic body. Stephen, in fact, looks out at the Sanhedrin from inside a reality that has captured them, but they refuse to see it. His face looks like that of an angel because he is already living in a world 
where the Holy Spirit is reordering life such that it begins to look more and more like heaven. And the religious elites are kind of standing on the outside and they are skeptical and they are angry and they are threatened. And so they take matters into their own hands and they stone Stephen. And the Bible then tells us that one of the men who approved of his death In the last video, we reflected on, on Stephen, and uh, Stephen who was called and no sooner arrested, and then before the end of the chapter, he was, he was stoned to death. Did you notice how, how he died? While he's dying, he says these words. He says, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. Sound familiar? Yes, it sounds just like Jesus, just like the words of Jesus when he died. Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And so what we learn from this, that, that when the Holy Spirit begins to transform our life, when the Holy Spirit begins to direct our life, we can not only live like Jesus, but we can also die like Jesus. Isn't that incredible? That we can, we can die loving our enemies. Now, chapter, chapter 8, we introduced to, well, to Saul. And Saul was part of, we, we read that he was somehow part of the stoning of Stephen. And, and we wonder how it affected him. I mean, to see, to see someone die, to die such a violent death, but to die with such grace and such mercy extended to those doing the killing. We, we wonder how that influenced his life. How, we wonder how God used that in his life. In chapter 8, we read that because of Saul's persecution, people scattered everywhere. One of the places they scattered to was Antioch. And then we read that, well, it goes on a little bit, and Saul gets permission. I mean, Saul is so passionate about persecuting the followers of the way that he gets permission to, to go to Damascus to extend his state of emergency, his reign of, of, well, of fear and death. He's on a mission. I mean, Saul has always been a missionary. He was a missionary of death. That's how he started out. And we read that on the, on the road to Damascus, this great light comes and strikes him blind. Uh, he falls off uh, his horse and, uh, and he hears these words. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Notice that, that the words are not Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting them? Saul, why are you persecuting me? You see, when we persecute anybody for any reason, we're actually persecuting Jesus. Especially when we persecute the least. Jesus takes persecution personally. Now, we, we, we speak sometimes of the conversion of Paul on the road to Damascus. That's not conversion. I mean, when he's struck blind, that's not conversion. Um, Saul is convicted. He is prevented from carrying out his mission of death. That's what happens. And then he goes off to a place um, and, he, and he hangs out there for a while. And while, while he is blind and trying to come to grips with what's happened to him on this road, God is busy engaging someone else. That's how God works. God is always engaging many people and then bringing the pieces or the people together. So, so God engages uh, Ananias. Now, if you think that was a miracle on the road to Damascus, this is an even greater miracle. God says to Ananias, listen, there's a guy called Saul. Uh, he's blind. He needs your help to see again. Why don't you go and lay hands on him? And you can see Ananias saying, hang on, hang on, hang on. I, I know who you're talking about. This is Saul who has permission to, to, to arrest and persecute and maybe even stone us to death like it happened to Stephen. Is that who you're talking about? Well, I'd love to go lay hands on him, but it ain't going to be the way you want me to lay hands on him. And, and God says, no, I want you to go lay hands on him. And, and Ananias, you can see him struggling with this. He's saying, Lord, do you know who this is? He has permission to persecute all of the followers of your son in this area. And if he's going to do it in alphabetical order, I'm in big, big trouble, Lord. Go. This sounds like sending Jonah out again to Nineveh. So Ananias goes, and that's the miracle. Ananias goes. Ananias believes that God is is at work in Saul, the persecutor's life. He goes and he touches Saul. That is the moment of conversion. It's at that moment where Saul experiences God's 
Well, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, God's mercy, God's forgiveness, being washed. How? Through the mercy of his enemy, through the mercy of one who he has permission to arrest and to kill. Through Ananias' grace, he experiences the larger grace of God. We, we name many children Saul. We, main, we name many children Paul. How many of us name our children Ananias? A little bit later, another person, totally underrated in the scriptures, Barnabas. I mean, what he does, he collects Saul and he brings him to the underground church in Jerusalem. I mean, have you ever, they must have stripped. I mean, they said, what are you doing bringing the enemy into this place? We've, we've, we've spent a lot of time and energy trying to hide our tracks to be able to worship in quiet and safety. And now you're bringing Saul here? Barnabas believes that God is doing something in Saul's life that Saul has actually changed. Ananias and Barnabas have to be some of the most underrated characters in, uh, in the New Testament. What Barnabas does further, you can understand. I mean, Saul has created havoc, terror, for so many people's lives. We read at the beginning of chapter 8 that people had fled in many different places, including a place called Antioch. Now, if they fled there, that means they're kind of internal refugees, internally displaced people. They would have left their houses. They would have left what they knew to go and, well, maybe enter, in some formal, in, enter into some kind of informal settlement or um, some makeshift housing or to live with others. They, they, they've lost stuff. Barnabas one of us, you can hear him having a conversation with Saul, saying, you know what, Saul, now Paul, you need to, yes, you, we can see the forgiveness of God in your life, but you need to experience the consequences of your sin that continue to exist way after you have been forgiven for your sin. So for Barnabas, take Saul to Antioch. Antioch is this informal settlement where people have fled because of Saul's persecution. And we read that Saul, stroke Paul, begins to live there, work there. They welcome him. He, we know that he's a tent maker. He works. He, he works to begin to reconstruct and develop that area. And, and we read these incredible words. It's in Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, we read these words. And it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. Antioch, this enemy-loving community. When we welcome the persecutor, into our midst, and the persecutor begins to work to heal the damage that that persecutor has wrought on this community. It's, it's, then that, it's then that people become known as Christians in Antioch. The plot is thickening in the story of Acts. We're meeting so many new characters and uh, the Holy Spirit is doing so many things. And um, today we're focusing on the transformation of these three men, Stephen, Saul, and Ananias. And I think that the least known of these three is probably Ananias. So why don't we focus our conversation on Ananias today? Sure, let's do that. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Willie Jennings says that discipleship, truly being a follower of Jesus, presses us to reorder our knowledge. Another way of that saying that might be being a follower of Jesus presses us to change our minds. Right. Which is like kind of a loaded thing to do in this day and age. Exactly. Exactly. Is there a time in your life where you felt your knowledge was reordered or your mind was changed through an encounter with the Holy Spirit? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, my, my time in seminary um, definitely uh, was a time where everything that I believe was, was challenged and reconstructed. Um, I just graduated back in May, so everything that, I, I, that I've learned is still like really fresh. Um, but I, I can remember back to my first semester, uh, we, uh, my, my professors uh, um, taught us this thing called embedded theology. And basically what embedded theology is, is that we all come into the world or come into seminary uh, rather 
with uh, this belief, this theology uh, that has been put into us, maybe from birth, maybe from being taught, raised in the church. And so uh, I went into seminary uh, with, with this embeddedness, thinking that I knew everything about God, the Holy Spirit, the church, because I've been brought up in church all my life. And seminary, <laughs> the one that I went to, uh, took me as this, you know, nicely, neatly packed person, totally just crushed that, <laughs> made me look at myself as this big jumbled up mess, <laughs> and uh, basically reconstructed me about everything I believed about God, the Holy Spirit, the church, um, and it was hard, it was hard having to rethink what I thought I knew about God, what I thought I knew about the Holy Spirit, what I thought I knew about the scriptures. And so, uh, but now I've gone through that three-year experience, uh, it's made me a better person. So what do you feel like, uh, like, are you done? Like, are you complete? You know, like you're, you know what you believe now and like you're a finished product? Oh gosh, no. <laughs> wish no no i'm not no i i, I am by far a finished product <laughs> no uh, we're going on, going on to perfection as wesley teaches us <laughs> yeah it almost seems like um christians we as christians we feel like to be faithful is to hold so tight hold on tight to it exactly you've been taught about God or we know about God or we know about our faith when really to be faithful to Jesus is to be faithful to the movement of the Holy Spirit and to have a looser grip on the things that we think we know so that we can actually be open to where the Holy Spirit is leading us and teaching us exactly Exactly. It's much easier to follow the, the flow of the Spirit. Things seem to go a whole lot easier when we just follow the flow of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Philip. No problem. Thank you, Bonnie. Have a good week. You too. Trinity Saints, we have just about three weeks before Lent begins, that season of preparation for Jesus' passion. And this year during Lent, Philip and I will be facilitating a class on this book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, by theologian James Cone. It is one of the most influential books that has been written in the last 15 years. It is a hard read and a good read. And I think it will be very thought provoking for us. We're gonna offer this class on Sunday mornings during Lent after our Zooms all together uh, over Zoom. So uh, I encourage you to buy this book wherever you buy books if you would like to participate. Won't you receive this benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up her countenance upon you. 
and give you peace. Go forth trusting in the love of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Live in peace and in joy. Amen.